Welcome to Living Water Bible Fellowship. We hope that what you hear encourages you in your personal walk with Jesus Christ. Stay tuned afterwards for more information. Thank you guys for gathering in the presence of the Lord today, for intentionally being here and wanting to meet with the Lord. That fact is not lost on the Lord. He knows that there's many other things you could do today, many other entertainments, many other uh, focuses that you could bring to your life today, but you've chosen to be here in his presence. It's a great thing to meet with God. It's an important thing to meet with God. And guys, let's be a church that seeks God's face. Let's be a church that seeks God's presence. The songs that we sang today is about the glory of God and about being in the presence of God. It's a beautiful and a wonderful thing to know God, to worship God. May we become a people that are in the presence of God, loving God and serving God and ministering to God. It's a wonderful thing to be his worshipers. Please open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, verse 1, please. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are stiff-necked people, for if for a single moment I should go up with among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. Therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Oreb onward. And please pause there. Our journey through Exodus has been one of a God creating a people for Himself. A God who's called a people to be His, to, to, be, to be close to Him, to be near to Him. He spoke long ago to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, make, make, making promises that their descendants would be His people. And sure enough, we get to the book of Exodus. Uh, he calls the people for himself. He starts with Moses. He's heard the cries of the people, and, and the cries come to God, and, and, he, and, he, and he, he goes through Moses, and he rescues the people for himself. He doesn't leave the people out there. He brings the people to himself. They meet with him on the mountain. In Exodus, uh, we see that God's presence is especially located Mount Sinai. Like we know enough from our Bibles to know that God is imminent. He's everywhere in this world. There isn't a place you can go in this world or in this universe where God is not. His Spirit is present wherever you may go, but there's, there's, there's places and times where God's presence is especially located. He called the people to Mount Sinai to meet with Him. The people could not go up on the mountain because of His holiness. He called them to be his people. I will be your God. You'll be my people. And, and, and he shared his covenant with them, his rules, his stipulations, his laws. And he said, we're going to do everything you say. We're going to do everything you say. We will be your people. They said it twice. We will be your people. Will you be our God? And the covenant there, it's just this beautiful, the, the, the signing, the sealing of the covenant you know, yes, it's like a marriage coming together. Yes, we're going to be one. And so we saw in, in several of our sermons how 
God's commandments came. God's commandments came. His blessing came. His closeness came. And he calls Moses up on the mountain again, and Moses goes away, and we, we saw in Bo's sermon a few weeks ago just how, how quickly they fell away. Within six weeks of saying, yes, Lord, I'm yours. Yes, Lord, I'm yours. This great apostasy happened. Remember the golden calf incident? They created a God of their very own. They created a God that they could worship in the way they wanted to worship. It was ugly and it was horrible and it was disgusting what happened at the foot of the mountain. So we saw how God reacted. He, he, he told Moses, I, I can't go with this people. I'm going to consume this people. I'm going to destroy this people. Go down to them. And, and Moses went down. And remember, Moses prayed. Last week, Moses prayed. And God, God, please turn from your anger. Please relent from your anger. And God relented. God turned. God heard Moses' prayer. And then we, we come to chapter 33. The people are, are hoping that they're still in God's good graces. They're, they're hoping that the, the covenant is still on. And what we read here, it starts off great, right? It starts off great. God says, guess what? You're still going to get the promised land, a land flowing of milk and honey, I mean, prosperous land. I'm going to bless you with this land. It's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful, this land. And, and not only that, I'm going to keep my promise to send an angel with you. You're going to have someone with you all the way. You're not going to be alone. And that angel, when he gets into the land, I'm going to drive out all the peoples there. Now, we go back. There, there's other places where we, we know why God is driving out the people because of their great sin. God is bringing judgment on those people through the Israelites. God says, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to drive out your enemies. It's going to be great. And then the, the word, the disastrous word that breaks their heart. God says, but I'm not going with you. And we see here in the text the people mourn. When you mourn, when you lost somebody, right? When you lost a relationship, when you lost someone close to you, the emotions of mourning, the grieving, the, the tears, the weeping at your loss, that's what's happening here. Because by God saying He's not going with them, He's saying the covenant is no longer in force. He's saying this relationship, I'm going to, get, I'm going to keep my promises, I'm going to get you there, but the relationship, it seems to the Israelites, God is saying it's over. And they weep and they mourn. Moses uh, hears God's word. He was up on the mountain. He was up on the mountain interceding for them. Right? He, remember when, when, when he asked God to forgive Israel for their great sin, he says, man, if you, if you don't forgive them, take me in their place. Blot me out of your book. The great love of Moses for his people. He prayed, he prayed for, for Israel. He hears this. God sends him, sends him back down to the mountain with this message. You know, tell them I'm not going with them. Have them strip off their ornaments. And God says something like a little sign of hope that I may decide what to do with them. There's still some hope in the air. You know, with God, there's always still some hope in the air. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Like some of us, when we sin and, and some, some of the things we've done or some of the things we've said, we feel so devastated, like we, we've cut the relationship with God and there's no hope. But the Bible is a book of hope. There's always some hope in the air with God. If you're here today and you feel like you've gone too far, maybe... God will not have you anymore. There's always hope in God. But he says, strip off your ornaments. Take off your ornaments. And what are ornaments anyway? Like, are they like Christmas trees with their ornaments? Hope you don't have that picture in your mind. Ornamentation. Some people, they wear a lot of ornamentation, jewelry, hats, fancy dress, fancy clothes. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, what did God give them? Kind of as a wage, perhaps, for their slavery. They plundered the Egyptians. God allowed the Egyptians, said to the Egyptians, give, you know, ask the Egyptians, and God made it in their hearts, so the Egyptians gave them all their wealth. 
their clothing, everything they had, basically, that was worth value. And we saw, when we talked about the golden calf, they gave some of that ornamentation to Aaron to melt down to make the golden calf, but they still had plenty left. So they had this, this, this apparently this rhythm or this way of living where they dress up in their finery. You know, they're out in the desert. I don't know why, why they're doing that. But they're dressing up in the best. Maybe, maybe you know, you, they came from a setting where they always had the worst as slaves. Maybe now that they have the best, they're putting on the best all the time. I don't know. <clears throat> but but if, you're, you're, if you're content, if you're happy, you're not going to wear your best. And so God says, you know, take off. The, and they strip off their or, or, ornamentation. They strip it off. Like, like, they don't just take it off. They rip it off. It's an action term. It's, it's like they stripped it off. Like they were so ready, and it was a sign of their repentance. It was a sign of their brokenness. It was a sign of their wanting God. It's like, uh, you know, sometimes in the Old Testament, we see sackcloth and ashes, right? When people mourn for something or they were praying, when they were fasting, sometimes they put on sackcloth, very itchy material to show God their uncomfortable nature. They put soot or ash on their face to show their, their, their brokenness and their, their shame, you know, it's a way of praying. So this, this is kind of like stripping off the ornamentation, all their jewelry, all their finery, and saying, God, we don't need this stuff. We need you. God, we don't need that stuff. We, we need you. Don't we as a people need the living God in our life? Don't we need him to go to work with us? Don't we need him in our marriage? Don't we need him in our parenting? Don't we need God in our finances? Don't we need God's presence, his powerful presence in our life? We need him desperately. And so the Israelites, think about their journey. I mean, there's times when they're close to God, when they're desirous of God, they want to be close to God. There's other times like the golden calf thing when they are far from God. They broke God's heart. But here, after that great sin, have you noticed in your life, I've noticed in my life, there's times when I've sinned, uh, when I've returned to the Lord, and that presence of God is just so sweet. I, I, I just want to be closer and closer and closer. I think this is a time where the people are like, oh, he didn't blow us up. God, can we come back? Can we be close? And when, they, when he says he's not going with them, it's just like oh, the mourning, the weeping. They know they need God. Finally, they know they need God, and God's saying, I'm not going with you. It's not good news. Think about the, the setting. Think about what, they, what they're being offered. God's saying, basically, he's saying, you know, in our terms, I'm going to give you the American dream. I'm going to give you a prosperous land without any competition. I'm going to give you a prosperous land without any enemies a land flowing with milk and honey, you and your children are going to have everything you need. You will lack for nothing. And you're not going to be alone. I'm going to send an angel with you. You're good to go. And yet they're weeping. What's going on? It's because they know they need God more than all the bling. They need God more than all the stuff. They need God more than all the prosperity. They need God more than all the wealth and riches of the land. <clears throat> this might step on some toes, but, you know, so be it. Uh, perhaps uh, you, perhaps me sometimes, um, we, want, we want God to do what we want. We want God's greatness in our life to accomplish what we want. We want... God to bless us without wanting God. How many of us American Christians say, God, bless my business, bless my family, prosper us, give us health, but we really don't want you? Can you imagine how God feels when we pray those kind of prayers and we really don't want Him personally? Give me, what, give me what I want. Give me your riches. Give me your wealth, God. But you, I don't think I want as much. But here are the Israelites. God's saying, I'm going to give you everything you need, everything you want. And they're mourning and they're weeping because they know they want God most of all. Isn't that beautiful? 
Isn't that wonderful? To seek God's presence, to seek his face, to want him above all things. That's where I want to be as a man of God. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. You can have all the accolades and all the plaques and all the golden watches. You can have the house. You can have the retirement package. Give me Jesus. So Jesus says, hey, I'm not going with you. And their hearts are broken. But there's hope. God says, I'm going to see what I'm going to do with you. And they respond very well. They, they show where their hearts are at. They strip off the ornamentation. They throw off the jewelry, all the finery, and say, God, we want you. That, that's what they're saying through those symbolic actions. And so Moses, writing the book of Exodus, he's telling us this story. And in verse 7, he pauses. And he says, remember this time. He says, there was a time when they were close to God, and, and I was close to God too. Look at verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting. Everyone who sought the Lord would go out of the to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak to Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. This the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Moses turned again into the camp. His assistant Joshua, son of Nun, the young man, would not depart from the tent. And just I said in the first service, man, that last sentence, the young man would not depart from the tent. There's a great sermon there. He did not want to leave the Lord's presence. Honestly, guys, there's times I want to leave the Lord's presence. There's times I don't want to be accountable to God. There's times um, I want to do my own thing. There's times I want to walk my own way. <clears throat> That's always wrong. <laughs> That's always the bad move to not walk with God when God wants to walk with us. But Moses, you know, now Moses used to take the tent. So he's talking in the past tense. He's like, there was a time, you guys, you wouldn't know it by the golden calf incident, but there was a time when Israel was pursuing God and they were seeking God. When God would show up, they'd stand up and they'd worship. When God would show up, they'd give him honor and respect. Glorious times, Moses is recalling. You know, uh, Moses said, I, I, you know, we, we meet face to face. And of course, God doesn't have a face. God is spirit. And so it's a figure of speech. And talks in these texts about God's hands and feet and standing, you know. He, he, it's, it's accommodating our minds. But God showed up in the cloud. God showed up and, and was present face to face, meaning he was intimate with Moses, relationally close, not distant, not way out there somewhere. God came close. And guess what? That song we sang, one day, Glory and honor and power and wealth will be singing that to God because we will be with God. We will be in that closeness, in that relational closeness, in that intimacy with God when heaven comes down. I can't wait for heaven, you guys. I can't wait to be with my God. I can't wait to be in the presence of my Lord. See, we're able to do that, right? The Israelites couldn't go up on the mountain. We're able to come into the presence of the Lord boldly now because of Jesus Christ and His shed blood. Jesus died on that cross as our substitute to cleanse us from our sins, to die in our place. When we place our faith in Jesus, not only are we declared righteous, we're justified in the sight of God. We receive the righteousness of God. We receive the righteousness of Christ so we can stand in the presence of the living God, holy and cleansed. Man, we can approach now the throne of grace with confidence, and one day... <laughs> Our faith will become sight. Right now we see it in the, in the, you know, through, the mirror, through the things darkly. It's, it's not clear. One day, man, heaven, it's going to be great. The presence of God is going to be glorious, and we're going to be able to stand in his presence. Man, can't wait, you guys. 
the Moses, he's meeting in, in the intimacy and closeness. And I just love this, this passage, how, how the people, when, when they see God coming, they stand up and they worship. They want him to be near to their nation and to their people, to their families. And, and I think Moses recalls that because, again, he's just mentioned a, a, a glimmer of hope for Israel. And he recalls former days as if to think the former days, they could become the future for you as well. I guess what I'm trying to say through that is if you're far from God right now, you feel far from God, you feel distant from God, you don't have a clue about God right now. It could be a time in the future where you draw near to God and God draws near to you and you know He's present. Don't give up seeking the Lord. Keep pursuing the Lord. Presence with God is His idea. He made us in his image and his likeness, so we could have a relationship with him. Pursue God. Come into his presence. Seek his face. God loves it when we do that. So it's like in verses 1 through 6, there's this action, this, this narrative. Then he pauses from 7 to 11, kind of a dramatic pause. Oh, we could be in that presence again. And then in verse 12, he picks up the narrative, the action again. Look at verse 12 with me. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you'll send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. You found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. <laughs> and God said, and he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Wow, pause there. So God reveals, kind of like as we saw last week, God says, I'm going to do this. It's kind of like a, a prompter. What are you going to do, Israel? You know, it, what are you going to do, Moses? Moses prays here for himself, first of all. Notice the pronouns me, me, me. He's talking about himself. He's praying to God. God, you've given me this job. Basically, this is what he's saying. You've given me this big job of leading your people. You said that I'm in your favor. You say I'm your man. You say that, you know, you like what I'm doing. And now you tell me you're not going with me. You're sending just an angel. Just an angel. <laughs> you see, back a few chapters, uh, God, God mentioned that he would send an angel, but his presence would be kind of in the angel or with the angel. Some people think it's the pre-incarnate Jesus that he's going to send. That Jesus is going to go with them. There's a lot of mystery there. But Mount Moses thought that God would go with him, and now he's saying, oh, you don't even tell me, tell me who you're going to send. Are you going to go with me or not? It doesn't sound like you're going to go with me. I can't go without you. In other words, you say that you found favor in me, that, that you please with me? Come on, show me your ways, God. I cannot lead these people without you showing me how to lead them. I need you to show me your ways. Have you gone to work and ever cried out like that? Have you been in a marriage, in, in a family situation where you just get down on your knees and say, God, I need you to show me how to do this because I'm clueless. If you have not, why not? Don't we need to know God's ways as well? Don't we need God to show us? Or do we have it all together? We need God desperately in our life. If you don't think you need God desperately in your life, something's wrong. So Moses says, come on, God, please. You've got to show me your ways. And that, that's a great way to pray as, as well. If you think maybe you don't know how to pray, you know, he, say, he says, uh, you said God. Now, God loves it when we repeat back his promises. It shows several times in the scripture where, where we re recite God's promises to him. God, you said this. You said you were going to you know, glorify yourself through the nations. You said this and this and this. God loves it when we pray that way. If you don't know how to pray, repeat God's prayers back to him. His promises back to him, rather. It's a beautiful way. And then, then ask God to, to, for his ways. Do you think God responds well when we ask him to show, for him to show us his ways? Absolutely he does. Now, think about just... Make up in a scenario in your mind, like maybe you're looking for work right now, or maybe you don't know how to parent right now, or maybe you don't know how to be married right now. 
And so you go to God and say, God, I, I, I need you to do this and this and this, and I need you to do this and this and this. Amen. Or you tack on, in Jesus' name, amen. As if that's some kind of a binding to God or something, that he has to do it because you said Jesus' name. Wouldn't it be better if we went before God with our job needs or our health needs and we say, God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Wouldn't it be better when we prayed, when we went to God and say, when we said to him, God, show me your ways out of this mess. Show me your ways how to communicate as, as a spouse. Show me your ways how to parent or how to deal with that, that guy at work. I'm listening, Lord, for your wisdom and your discernment, for your ways. Man, wouldn't that be wise if we acted like he was God and we weren't? Your ways, Lord, please show us your ways. Okay, so he prays, and then he prays, and God says, my presence will be with you. I will give you rest. What does he mean? Moses, don't be so anxious. I'll give you peace. I have found favor in you. I have called you to this job. You've asked me for my power, my help. Rest, Moses. Be at peace. I am with you. One of the blessings of knowing God is with you, one of the blessings of being in God's presence is we can have peace. We can have peace that God knows what he's doing and he will lead us well. Praise God when God is present. So he says another prayer, however. He kind of... He kind of is walking up this ladder, more intense prayers, as it were. Verse 15, and he said to him, Moses said to God, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here, for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight? In other words, Moses is saying, hey, if you don't go with us, you know, how, how do these people know I'm your leader? You've got to go with me. <clears throat> I and your people... Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other pe people on the face of the earth? So kind of the emphasis changes from I to we, from I to us. He moves further. He starts with himself, but then he moves further. God, you've got to be with this nation. You're, this nation needs your presence. These people need your presence. For if we go up, will it be like all the other religious people? If we go up without you, We'll be like all the other re religious people, all the other lost people that know nothing, that are not in a relationship with God. It's your presence that makes us who we are. We're distinctive because you're in our midst. See, see what I'm saying? See what mo what's going on here? Like, we're all a religious people, you know? All, you know, the seven, eight billion people on the earth, we're all our religious people because God has wired us to be religious people. But... There's so many religions and so many ideas about God that are just so far off base. It's just busy work, busy work, busy work, treadmill work, 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 and see what God brings. That We have that inclination, that desire. Moses says, we're made distinctive because you're in our life. We as Christians are made distinctive because we are in Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit is in us. Because God is present with his people. And Moses says, if you don't go up, what's the point? If you don't go with us, God, maybe this is a prayer you could pray sometime. If you don't go with us in our marriage, <laughs> we're in trouble. You have to go with us. Please, God, go with us. Moses says to the, peop Moses says to the Lord, man, God, it would so, be so bad for us to go without you. If you're not going with us, don't even send us to the promised land. Again, the same values as Israel earlier. God said, I'm going to give you the best. I'm going to give you prosperity and blessing. And Moses says, who cares if we're rich if we don't have you? Who cares if we're wealthy and we don't have you? All that is empty. All that is wasted. All that is brokenness without you. The American dream, give me the next level. Give me the next section of house. Give me the next job upgrade. And Moses would say, if God's not in it, it's a waste of time. You need God's presence. That's why we were created to know and serve God. If we don't know and serve God, what's the point of our creation? Moses says, hey, if you don't go with us, don't even send us. 
We were made to be worshipers of the Lord. If we're not worshipers of the Lord, if we're not glorifying God, our life is misspent. And so having said that, if you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've not placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've not trusted Him as your Lord and Savior, repent and believe on Jesus and you will be saved. Repent of your sins, your wickedness, your trespasses, your evils. Turn to Him and let Him save you and He will save you. And you'll find your purpose You'll find your focus. You'll find the reason why you're here on this planet to serve and worship this great God and Savior. But Moses is like, hey, don't, don't. And what, what does God say? Going back to last week, how can a sovereign God that knows all things, how can he respond to the prayers of people like Jerron or Amy or Tim or Virginia? How, how could a sovereign God take our prayers and use them? But we see it again. Moses prays for God to go with him, and God says, okay, what? God answers prayer. Prayer changes things because the living God wants his people to pray. He allows our prayers to affect him and to walk with him. He, he wants our presence. He wants this relationship, you guys. What if we never sought the presence of God in our life? How tragic. What if we never drew near to the God who made us to be His? Wow. That would be terrible. So Moses prays again, and God says, yes, I'll go with you. What? Wow. And then Moses gets the most intense prayer of all in this passage. Verse 18, Moses said, please show me your glory. Please show me your glory. Do you realize how audacious a prayer that is? Now, we've, we've actually sung a song like that, show us your glory, Lord, we want to see your face. That's a crazy prayer. That's a crazy, because if God showed up in his glory... We'd all be dead. Outside of Christ, if we didn't have that covering of Christ, if we were not covered in the blood of Jesus, if we were not covered in the righteousness of Christ, if we were not in Christ, God shows up. How can the Holy One that made the universe come and meet us and, I, and, and we survive? So Moses is praying this, and he's not asking for a theophany. He's not asking for God to show up in the pillar of cloud again. He's not asking for God to show up in the fire again. God showed up many times in Moses' life. God, they, they talked face to face. They had a relationship. God is, Moses is asking God to show him his very self. Do you, do you see the pattern here? Israel and Moses wants more and more of God. Do you want more and more of God or are you just you're set with God where you are right now? Do you want more and more of God in your life? Do you want more presence of God in your life? Do you want to be closer to God? Are you saying, oh, God, you paid the rent this week. I'm good with that. A hunger for God, a seeking of His face, a desire to be in His presence. It's called worship. He's made us to be worshipers. It's a beautiful thing when God's people do what they're made to do. So show me your glory. Please show me your glory. And he said, I'll make all my goodness pass before you. I'll proclaim before you my name, the Lord. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, and I'll show mercy to whom I'll show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see my face and live. Now you can see God, but you're dead the second you see God. You can stare at the sun for a little bit, but then you're not going to be able to see for very long. How much greater is God than this small sun that our planets orbit around? How much more grand is He? How much more holy is He? We could not see God for very long and, and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. 
My glory passes by. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll cover you with my hand until I've passed. Then I'll take away my hand. You shall see my back. My face, you shall, it shall not be seen. So God's saying, hey, you can't see all of me, but you can see a little bit of, you can see my afterglory. Now again, God doesn't have a body, so you know, the, the, the anthropomorphic kind of language here, the, using human terms to describe God, it's, it's a condensation to our smallness. But God is saying, you'll see part of me, you'll see my afterglory. <laughs> is that going to be enough? But did you notice there, God, when Moses says, show me your glory, what did God say? I'm going to show you my goodness. What? How do you see a characteristic or an attribute? I'm going to show you my goodness. In other words, God is saying, you asked to see my glory, I'm going to show you my character. I'm going to show you my goodness. I'm going to show you my greatness. How are you going to do that? Let's look. Uh, chapter 34, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first. I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Remember, Moses came down the mountain, he saw Israel and their pagan revelry. He broke the tablets. Uh, Moses got very angry. Be ready in the morning and come up in the, the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there for me on top of the mountain. So Moses is called up for the seventh time up the mountain. No one shall come to me. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze upon the mountain, uh, opposite that mountain. Again, we have the the ability to approach the throne of grace with confidence because we're in Jesus. Our sins have been forgiven. We can go to God directly, but the people back then could not. It was dangerous to go in the presence of God. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first. He rose early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. He took in his hand two tablets of stone. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Okay, so God came down in, in his presence Moses wanted to see the presence of God. He wanted to see, be closer to God, more and more intimate with God. And God, God says, yes, it's a holy moment. But notice as we read this that God, Moses does not give a, a travel description. He does not give a, a picture of what he saw. Like you think if you saw God, like in, in this day of Instagram or Facebook, like there'd be all kinds of snapshots all, psh, 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 psh. look at that, God, you know, the sounds, the sights, the power the colors, who knows what Moses saw. Moses doesn't do any of that because it was more important for Moses to hear what God said about himself. In other words, it was more important for, for Moses to know God than to see God. This is how Moses writes down what he saw because it's revelation. And this is the God that we serve. I don't know what your connotation of God is like, but listen to this description that the Lord gives of himself. Maybe one of the purest descriptions that we have what the Lord is like. Verse 6, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children, the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshipped. He said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Moses said, We want you, God. We need you, God. But the Lord's presence came down, and Moses saw his goodness in the speech of God. What kind of a God is it that we serve? A merciful God. Some of your translations say compassionate. God cares for the meek and the hurting and the lowly. He's a gracious God. In other words, our God does not give us what we deserve. He does not give us death. He does not give us judgment. He gives us grace. He finds ways to forgive us, to meet our needs when we didn't deserve it. Slow to anger. Praise God for that one, right? Man, he's... He's long to bring judgment. He's, lo he's long suffering. We sin against him again and again. We break his heart again and again. We draw away from him again and again. But God is patient with us. He's slow to anger. What a great God we serve. Slow to anger. Abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. 
the hesed of God, the, the mercy of God, this, this, this covenanting love that just keeps going and going and going. Our God is not like people that fly off the handle and, and get angry and break their covenants. Our God keeps His promises. Our God's love never ends. Our, God love, our God's love never ends. It's this pursuing passionate love of giving of Himself again and again and again. Our God is a great God keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Man, the forgiveness of our God. Our God is a forgiving God, and we see it with Israel. Because remember the, the tablet thing? What was the big deal about the tablets? Why did, why did God have Moses make two more tablets? Because Israel thought that the covenant was over. By God making two more tablets, having Moses make two more tablets, it was like God saying, you're still in covenant with me. You're still in relationship with me. It's okay. His mercies are new every morning. His forgiveness is great. And yet, He punishes wickedness. He punishes evil. Praise God for that. The impetus of the passage, the, the, the drive of the passage, the way that Moses has painted the picture for us is that here's a people who are offered riches and wealth and prosperity, and they say they want God more. Here's a people who want more and more of God, who want to be in His presence, who want to worship Him and glorify Him. Oh God, please go with us. Moses bowing down and worshiping. We need you more than anything. Is that the cry of your heart today? If not, let me tell you plainly, you need God more than anything in your life. You need God more than anything in your marriage. You need God more than anything in your finances in your business. We were made for God. We were made to worship. And so if there's not a worship of God in your life, there's not a presence of God in your life, you're missing out on why you were created. So draw near to God in your life. Draw near to the living God once again. Maybe it's been a while since, maybe you've been far away from God for a while. Maybe you've been frustrated with God or angry with God, I don't know. But draw near to God again. Seek His face again. Pursue Him passionately again. Because his, his presence, you guys, is priceless. His presence is is priceless. There's nothing on earth that compares to being with God and having God with you. Before we leave, can we just take a moment silently in prayer? And I just ask you to come to this gracious God personally, to come to this, this compassionate God. Just, just pray to Him right now, just for a moment thank Him or glorify Him or confess that you need Him. Just silently with God right now. Go to Him. Thank Him for His attributes. Praise Him for His goodness. Thank Him for not abandoning you. Ask Him to forgive your sin. Worship Him. Our Lord God, thank you for meeting with us today. Our all-compassionate God, our all-gracious God, our slow-to-anger God, our abounding-in-love God, our abounding-in-faithfulness God. 
or maintaining love forever, God. Our judge, we come before you and we worship you this day. We want to know you more and more, Lord, so would you please draw near? Holy Spirit, would you fill us with your presence? Would you renew the joy of our salvation? We worship you this day, Lord. We ask that you and you alone be magnified in this world. Lord, if there's things that got us hooked, if there's things that we're worshiping that are not you, if there's other religions that we've trusted in or other pathways that aren't of you, we repent. Set us free, Lord. Make us yours again this day, Lord. There'd be no other place we'd want to be than with you, Lord. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Send us now, Lord, into the world as your worshipers, as your servants, as those whom you love and whom we love you, Lord. Be blessed by your church in this world. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching this teaching from Living Water Bible Fellowship. We hope that this teaching was an encouragement and a challenge to you in your personal walk with Jesus Christ. Living Water is a Bible-based, gospel-centered church, and our mission is to lead people into a life-changing and ever-growing relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're interested in more about us as a church, links and contact information are in the description box below. But be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell as well. Thanks again for watching.